Okay, so this is part three of the memory lecture, and we're focusing on why memory sometimes fails us. And there are seven different cat whoa, my bad, seven different categories. There are seven sins. We're going to take a look at each one of these uh, sequentially. So transience. Transience is just what happens. We deteriorate over time. Memories deteriorate over time. In fact, if we were to look at memory and its deterioration, you can see that if you learned Spanish in school and then left school, it would be within the first year, like even six months, you would lose 60% of that knowledge. That's in the first six months. And then after that, it would kind of up and down and then level off at about 30%. And that would be over a number of years. So you can see that it deteriorates very rapidly. And therefore, something needs to be actively done to keep memories alive. That's transience. Secondly is absent-mindedness. And that's simply forgetting that uh, things because your attention drifted to something else. So it's an encoding failure. Uh, and information just never gets into your memory at all. Since we can't attend to everything in the environment, uh, we can only choose specific things to attend to. Uh, and then when we shift our attention, we've lost it. So for instance, you rush into the house, your mind is totally on uh, something, some place you have to get to or something you have to do, and you put down your keys and move on. And then later when it's time to go, you can't remember where your, your keys are. That would be a lapse of attention. You were focused somewhere else, you didn't process uh, the uh, placement of your keys, bam, uh, you've lost it. I'm sure that you have lost your keys probably lost your phones and caused quite a pan panic in your mind while you tried to find it. Absent-mindedness or that lapse of attention can occur in a number, number of different places. Sorry about the typos. External events go into sensory memory. Uh, you could have a lapse of attention at that point. You could have a lapse of attention between sensory motor and short-term memory. And you can have a lapse in attention between short-term and long-term. So you can see there's ample opportunity uh, for <laughs> memory to not get processed into long-term. These are a couple of links I showed you already, I believe, in Sensation and Perception uh, about change blindness. Uh, if you remember uh, the experiment where somebody was asking for directions, and two confederates walked between them with a piece of plywood and the person originally asking for directions shifted with somebody else and that uh, about 55 percent of people didn't even notice that so and then also the monkey in the middle of the basketballs so you might want to see them again a couple more uh, videos of the original research uh, that was done uh, by simon Thirdly is what's called blocking. Sometimes we uh, interfere with our own memory. It could be proactive, it could be retroactive, or it could just be the serial position effect. In other words, uh, when you're learning something, suppose you're learning uh, different information. Sorry, I was reading. Different information. For instance, suppose I'm studying French. Uh, and then I go to study Spanish. Well, the French, which you learned beforehand, is going to interfere pro or forwardly with studying Spanish. Conversely, your study, your study of French is going to be impacted in the future by the study of Spanish. They're going to interfact, interfere with each other proactively and retroactively. So that tells us that it's important not to study 
similar subjects right after each other. So if I'm going to study French, then I should go to math and then Spanish because I will have less proactive interference and less retroactive interference. So keep that in mind when you're studying stuff. One of the things that we have found in research is that sleep causes the least retroactive interference. So if you've got a psych test on Tuesday, study it the last thing you do on Monday night, and then go directly to bed. Because you can see that your forgetting curve is much less after sleep than if you remain awake. That means even using your phone. Don't lay down in bed and get on your phones. The best bet for you is to just simply study and then go to bed. You'll do much better. Uh, the other aspects of interference is motivated forgetting. Sometimes people have things they just don't want to remember, and they will revise history, so to speak. Other times, events are so um, anxiety-producing that we repress them, push them down uh, into uh, unawareness. Uh, that will cause us to forget. And sometimes old information facilitates the learning of new information. So if you're somebody who studied Latin in high school, when you come to French in college, you're going to do better off because of that. So blocking interference, other bits of information coming in, can happen at all, whoa, back up, can happen at all those places. And you can see that the information bits decrease over time. Another category is what's called misattribution. That's when you recall memories, but they're associated with the wrong time, place, or person. I'll bet you that uh, you remember sitting at the Thanksgiving table. Everybody's there. The whole family's talking. They're sharing stories. And all of a sudden you go, ah, I didn't realize that's what happened. Or I didn't realize so-and-so was there. That's misattribution, simply that you didn't process that information at the time. And so also, if we're working at remembering repressed memories, people sometimes can create a memory. Uh, and that came uh, when a psychologist uh, accused someone of rape uh, because the client that she, he was working with had remembered it, but in actuality, the psychologist had guided that memory and the person misattributed it to someone else. Suggestibility is another category. <coughs> uh, suggestions uh, that people offer may help you reconstruct memory in the wrong way or create memory. Uh, so, witnesses to crime when they're interviewed by the police, might make specific suggestions. So, for instance, Loftus and Palmer has a, have a great uh, eyewitness experiment whereby they were shown slides of a car accident. And then they were asked specific questions about the speed of the cars. So, for instance, they might have been, uh, they might have been asked, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other, or smashed each other, or collided or bumped. Well, as you might guess, people estimated the speed of the cars faster when they were asked about how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other than they did when they were asked how fast were they going when they bumped into each other. So really, an eyewitness reconstructs a memory with following the suggestions that can be asked of them by the interviewer. So leading questions is something that's really important. And eyewitness accounts are trusted so much in courts, uh, but in reality, they are very inaccurate. In fact, if we were to sit down with 12 people that had watched a car accident at Dell Tech parking lot, we would get 12 different answers. 
uh, and it depends on a variety of factors, including your confidence. There's also bias, <clears throat> um, mood congruent memory and self-consistency bias. So we tend to uh, unconsciously remember events as being congruent with our expectations. Uh, in other words, we don't like things that are not congruent with what we think. Um, so our emotions can uh, bother us. Uh, if I remember something when I'm upset and then I recall it, then I may become upset again. Uh, there are persistent memories. <clears throat> You've had a song in your head that you couldn't stop singing, and so therefore it just stayed with you. So there are advantages. <clears throat> they may actually help us out. Uh, in other words, we don't have to uh, constantly shift our attention. We uh, may not have to always make meaning of something. Uh, we could improve our memory with mnemonics. Uh, and if you'll do a, a quick search of mnemonics and psychology, you'll find a, a tremendous number of tricks to help you remember. Uh, one of them is a method of loci, and we use that with a grocery list in uh, class. I won't do that now, but you can look it up and check it out. Um, if I wanted to remember uh, all of these items in a, in a, um, in a uh, shopping list, then what I could do is uh, method of loci means assume I'm walking into my house. When I grab the doorknob, it squishes, uh, and I realize it's made out of bread. When I open the door, I slip, and I realize there's milk on the, on the floor. And I can literally go through my house doing that, uh, and I'll remember that grocery list. As a matter of fact, if you were in one of my classes and I ran into you later in life, I could ask you about that grocery list and you'd still remember about 80% of it. So it's important here to do several things, to improve our memory, to help with psychology and learning. Make any material meaningful. If you don't like a class, figure out some way of making the material meaningful to you <clears throat> and you don't have to necessarily like it, but you'll have that meaning you can use to remember information. Spread your learning out over time so you don't have retroactive and proactive interference. Remember to minimize interference. Uh, the more things are interfering, the more information decreases as uh, time goes on. You want to remember to review and elaborate material. <clears throat> Go over it several different times. Uh, and be really creative in how you uh, think of that different material. It's important to continually test yourself uh, at least every other day. You ought to be reviewing about every third day uh, to help you uh, maintain that information. Here are a couple of different mnemonic sites. Oh, Quizlet is not a... Ah, it does have mnemonics. So uh, both of those are possible sites to go to. Um, if you open up the PowerPoint, you can just click on them, and they'll take you there. Okay, well, that covers memory for you. I hope this was helpful. And um, if we are to miss class again, I will try to make sure that I do this for you then also. So, thank you very much. And I'll see you in class. And somehow, I can stop this. Oh, there it is. See ya.